Appreciate that, Steve, one of you. Um, I'm a professor of philosophy here at Chafee. I've been here for, for 10 years now um, and seem to get roped into a lot of these discussions, either as a panelist or as a debater or moderating it, as in this case. Um, and these issues are right up my alley. My specialty is philosophy of religion, philosophy of science, uh, uh, language, and cultural theory. Uh, so this is, this is fun for me. It's good to be on this end of it and not on either one of these ends. I don't have to weigh in or uh, win friends or, or enemies. You don't win enemies, uh, make enemies. Uh, and that's that. But I want to say a couple things about, about the, uh, the structure of the event and sort of format. Um, first, I do want to thank a couple of people. Uh, this was sponsored uh, initially by the philosophy department and then co-sponsored with a couple of student clubs. The, the first was the League of Secular Free Thought. Am I getting that right, Stephen? The League, yeah, known as the League. Uh, new club on campus. The Philosophy Club also helped uh, both with the Facebook page with advertising and many other things. And then the Muslim Student Association also helped with advertising, getting the word out. So thank you all uh, for helping sponsor it. Uh, the last thing I was going to, last thank you, what is now a, a no thank you. Um, don't, don't tell me when I said this, but the AV department was going to set this up for, uh, for a DVD recording. So we had tables with all the people mic'd, a mic to the audience, and I got a call right before I left my office, Steve was in my office, uh, they weren't able to do so, something came up. So unfortunately there won't be a DVD at this event other than this one, which audio we'll see. Um, but, uh, but they tried, and at least we'll give them uh, that, I don't know what happened. Uh, that said, uh, a couple things about the event. First of all, you notice the title, uh, The Great Debate, Does God Exist? And then sort of the subtitle in some uh, flyers, in other cases, parentheses, it said, Does the God of Classical Theism Exist? Um, does everyone know the God of, what Classical Theism refers to? Mm -hmm. Some? Okay. <laughs> uh, it's sort of an odd construct. Uh, one kind of developed for things like this, a, a sort of a more uh, uh, equal debate format. It's a concept of God that's sort of, at least allegedly, shared by the great monotheist religions of the West, so Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. So uh, the attributes of that God are, are a God who's omniscient, right? All-knowing, omnipotent, all-good, omnibenevolent. Or what's right? What's right I say it. Uh, omniscient, omnipotent, all-powerful, uh, omnibenevolent, all-good, um, among others. Now there are several other attributes which we won't get into. I think which might take us away from this debate that are distinctive to one faith or another. And that's the point of this format: is to not get into you know debates of the Trinity or the prophethood of, of Muhammad. I mean, very interesting questions. Uh, but that would privilege one faith over another and could lead into uh, other discussions we're not trying to have. So the God of classical theism is supposed to be kind of the lowest common denominator notion of God uh, <coughs> that works well for philosophical discourse. So um, some of you, including myself, which I won't get into it too much, have some misgivings about that. It's sort of an odd thing, right? Or as one philosopher that I worked with said, it's the God of the philosopher, not the God of religion. Right? So it's just this concept of this, this God with his attributes that, that isn't entirely held by one faith. But it's shared, uh, and for that, that purpose, I think it will work well tonight. Uh, so, so that's that. Um, if you do have questions about other things, about the Bible, about the Quran, about specifics, you're welcome to bring those questions up in the Q&A, but those won't be the primary uh, uh, locus of discussion for tonight. So that, that's it. Um, now to the format. So it's pretty simple. We, we discussed it uh, at length and ended up with a, a very basic format, and that is that each panelist will begin to be given up to 15 minutes to make their case. Uh, we'll go in order of theist, atheist, theist, atheist. So I believe it'll be Andrew, uh, then Dan, then Steve, and then Steve. So uh, two Steves will be closing. Uh, and then, <laughs> then we'll have a five minute rebuttal slash clarification period for each of the panelists of five minutes apiece. Uh, so the total, a lot of time, is one hour. Uh, it's a two hour event, and so then comes the most important part, and that is uh, the discussion with all of you. So again, I, I'm serious about that. I think we all agree that's the most important part. We want you all to ask uh, thoughtful and critical questions. Uh, please prepare them ahead of time. Uh, these events, they tend to kind of get into a lot of open-ended <coughs> discussion and anecdotes by the audience members, so please uh, write questions ahead of time. Uh, you're welcome to, we'll probably form a line down that side, which might privilege some more than others. Maybe we can do both, since it looks like it's pretty packed, and we'll go side to side. Uh, so just line up at the end, but again, save them until the end, there will be no breaks in between for Q&A. All right. So lastly, uh, I guess to the panelists. So I'll start in the order, I'll go in the order of presentation. So first is Andrew Melkor. Uh, Andrew is a student here at Chafee who has been very active in philosophy department activities over the last couple of years. Uh, he earned one of our department's highest honors as the Religious Studies Student of the Year in 2008. And he has been accepted into one of the top philosophy programs in the country at the University of Arizona. He is also pursuing minors in both mathematics and physics at Arizona. His current research interests include philosophy of religion, philosophy of language, philosophy of science, metaphysics, and logic. Uh, I believe that Andrew is deserving of special recognition here, as he is the only undergraduate on the panel and has shown great courage in stepping into 
Uh, I put the lion's den, that sounded too cheeky, but uh, in this formal debate. <laughs> Religious, whatever, okay. Uh, next is Dan Mages. Uh, Dan graduated magna cum laude from the Master's College with a Bachelor of Arts degree in Biblical Studies with an emphasis in Bible Exposition. He received a professional clear California teaching credential from Cal State San Bernardino and has taught English at both Norco and Coachella Valley High Schools. He attended Fuller Theological Seminary for two years and graduated with a Master of Arts degree in Interdisciplinary Comparative Studies with an emphasis in World Religions, Christianity, and Ethics from Claremont School of Theology. He teaches philosophy and religion at Mount San Antonio College, at Chafee, Saddleback, and at Axia College. Uh, some of Professor Mage's most recent public presentations include a lecture on animal rights, a panel discussion concerning what happens after we die, and a forum at UCLA entitled Morality and Gods, Can There Be Ethics Without Deities? Lastly, he founded and maintains HungerTruth.com, there's your plug, a uh, uh, product designed to apply intellectual honesty toward religion, politics, health, and the environment. Uh, next is Stephen Paris. He holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in philosophy from UCLA and a Master of Arts degree in religion from Claremont Graduate University. He's also a PhD candidate at CGU in religion, specializing in philosophy, religion, and theology. He studied for four years with renowned philosopher D.Z. Phillips and is finishing his studies with Professor Patrick Horn. He is currently a philosophy professor at Azusa Pacific University, Cal State Long Beach, or sorry, Cal State Los Angeles, that's also a great school, uh, and here at Chase College. His areas of specialization uh, and interests include the philosophy of religion, Wittgenstein, modern uh, philosophy, modal logic, and atheism. He is also the author of a forthcoming book with McGraw-Hill on critical thinking. 2011, look for it, bookstore. Uh, he's also married with two children, ages three and four. And lastly, Steve Shiani uh, has a Bachelor of Arts degree in Liberal Studies and a teaching credential from Cal Baptist University. Uh, as a committed Christian for most of his life, he also attended Calvary Bible College for a year. Then his studies took him away from the faith, and he states that atheistic and agnostic answers were more compelling. He is now completing a Master's degree in Political Science from Cal State Fullerton, and he is currently a math teacher and has both personal and professional interest in philosophy, religion, science, and religion. All right, that said, I guess to the, to the debate. So uh, we do have a timekeeper here, so it is 15 minutes for the opening round. We'll be giving a two-minute warning, uh, and then a time's up, and we'll yeah, hose you off with something. And now, Professor uh, Mages, you have 15 minutes. All right, how's everyone doing tonight? Good. Good. Uh, good evening, welcome, I'm glad you guys are all here. My name's Lucifer. <laughs> the God of Classical Theism actually gave me a cold, so you can blame him for my nasally speech this evening. I want to thank the League of Secular Free Thought for putting on this event, for Jamima Galan for putting together this phenomenal PowerPoint you're about to experience and Richard Spencer for putting together a paper called The 15 Arguments for Atheism that is essentially the foundation to many of the arguments that Steve and I are going to put forward tonight. Um, before I begin, it's important to know that Steve and I spent many years as committed theists. I spent 12 of the last 15 years of my life as a deeply devout believer in the God of classical <coughs> theism, specifically the Christian God. I spent years evangelizing on the streets, attempting to persuade people to give their life to God. I prayed incessantly for God's guidance, insight, wisdom, understanding, knowledge, peace, love, and intervention. I went overseas on multiple mission trips, specifically to persuade people to give their life to God and build up religious institutions. I was compelled to study religion academically at the Master's College, at Fuller Seminary, at Claremont School of Theology down the street. Though we've changed over the years, our primary identities are not as atheists, since atheism doesn't say anything about what we do believe, only what we don't. We see ourselves as truth-seeking, life-promoting world citizens that desire every human on the planet to have access to healthy, cruelty-free food, clean water, pure air, safe shelter, and access to health care. More than anything else, we long to see peace, justice, and love reign throughout the world. However, we, along with most of the world's population, still desire immortality. In fact, if God exists, if God is reasonable and good, if God will make all wrongs right, we hope we are wrong this evening, and we'd be more than happy to change our views. However, there's a difference and a distinction between what we want, what we desire, what we hope for, thus the term wishful thinking, and what is likely, what is probable, 
what we have evidence for. That is what we know with relative certainty. We want to fly, breathe underwater, bring back to life the multitudes of sentient beings that have perished prematurely, like those on 9-11 and those in Iraq, the more than one million in Iraq, in fact, over the last decade, a considerable number of them women, children, the vast majority of them non being non-combatants. Reality is that it's highly unlikely that we will be able to achieve any of these particular wishes. In like manner, though we hope an omniscient, omnibenevolent, omnipotent being is governing the world, we are compelled by overwhelming evidence to think otherwise. It is significant to point out that we are all atheists. Given the definition of atheism as without belief in God or gods, the fact of the matter is that the vast majority of us are already atheists in regards to the thousands, even millions of gods that have been worshipped, honored, prayed to, served, and promoted. There is Zeus, the king of the Greek gods, Ra, the Egyptian god, <coughs> Brahma, the Hindu creator god, Vishnu, the sustainer, Shiva, the destroyer god of transformation. How about the goddess Aphrodite, or Dionysus, the god of wine, Nike, Hermes, Apollo, Thor, Osiris, and so forth and so on. We have only gone one god further. While we realize that no one can prove or disprove the god of classical theism's existence with 100% certainty, we, all, we also realize that we can't prove with absolute certainty that goblins, ghouls, gremlins, or leprechauns don't exist <laughs> somewhere, especially if they're invisible beings. Regardless, we don't need 100% certainty in order to have a high degree of assurance that magical <coughs> beings like Santa, the Tooth Fairy, or the god of classical theism does not exist. Since the hypothesis that offers the best explanation for the widest range of evidence is more likely true than other competing hypotheses, what we need to do is contrast the two competing hypotheses before us and determine which hypothesis better explains the available evidence. Hypothesis one, the god of classical theism exists. Roughly defined as a spiritual being who is omnipotent, omniscient, perfectly good, who is also the personal creator and sustainer of the world. Hypothesis two, the god of classical theism does not exist. You'll notice that our arguments this evening gain strength the more that we suppose God is actively and continually involved in the world, while they lose strength the more we suppose God is unconcerned with the world. The reason for this is simple. A detached, indifferent God would leave little to no empirical evidence of its existence. Because the following arguments are evidentially based, they have little to say about a God, for example, created the world intentionally to appear as if no God exists. A God that is merely an impersonal first cause, or a whimsical deist God who created the initial state of the universe and left everything else to chance. Gods such as these are what Victor Stanger, the author of The God Hypothesis, refers to as functionally equivalent to non-existent. Disbelief in them has no conceivable consequences, and since they serve no explanatory function, Belief in them represents an unnecessary multiplication of hypotheses. However, the god of classical theism is perfectly good and personal, thus not indifferent, detached, or impersonal. So let's take a look at the world and see if an absolutely benevolent being is consistent with what we find. Here are a number of arguments or lines of evidence that we think are better explained by atheism than by classical theism. Atheism offers the best explanation for the physical forces that cause natural disasters. Planet Earth moves, erupts, splits, grinds, and heaves, demolishing people, cities, children, animals, anything and everything, and it does not care. Just this year, in January, an earthquake hit Port-au-Prince, Haiti, <coughs> ravaging a place already besieged by poverty and exploitation. More than 222,000 people perished. In 2004, an earthquake in the Indian Ocean created a tsunami that indiscriminately killed 230,210 men, women, and children. In Sri Lanka, Christians, Muslims, Hindus, and the non-religious alike were decimated. We know these are just numbers and we have no way to fully comprehend the magnitude of these kinds of figures. The greatest number of people most of us have seen in a single place is probably at a sports stadium. Consider Angel Stadium. Angel Stadium has a max capacity of 45,050 people. The number of people that died in these two earthquakes alone 
is not just one or two nor three or four five or six not seven or eight or nine but more than 10 stadiums jam-packed may 12 2008 an earthquake in sichuan china killed some 80,000 people and left some 5 million more homeless. In the town of Zhuan, south of the epicenter, a three-story high school collapsed, burying as many as 900 students and killing at least 50. These are not rare or isolated events. In fact, history is chock full of similar unspeakable tragedies. On January 23, 1556, in Shaanxi, China, an earthquake eradicated the lives of 830,000 people at one time. That's 18 and a half stadiums. Just since the sixth century, earthquakes are responsible for the deaths of more than 12,500,000 individuals. That's 277 and a half stadiums. Just since the 13th century, floods and landslides have drowned approximately 6 million people. That's 133 stadiums. Since the 50s, nearly 1,000 people have been buried alive in avalanches. Just since the 18th century, or sorry, since the latter part of the 19th century, more than 6,500 people froze to death from blizzards. Since the latter part of the 19th century, more than, sorry, just since the 18th century, well over 2 million have died of cyclones. That's 44 and a half stadiums. Just since the 14th century, more than 159 million humans have starved to death because of a lack of rain or diseased crops. That's 3,529 and a half stadiums. Close to 70,000 human beings have died from heat waves since the 50s. Just since the 17th century, approximately 17,000 human beings have died from torrential rains and mudslides. Just since the 16th century, more than 6,500 flesh and blood human beings have died from tornadoes. Just since the 18th century, over 600,000 human beings have died as a result of tsunamis. Some 258,465 people have been turned to ash by volcanoes just since the first century. Folks, even lakes kill people. <laughs> Limbic eruption, otherwise known as lake overturn, takes place when carbon dioxide suddenly erupts from deep waters, asphyxiating wildlife, livestock, and humans. Just since the 80s, nearly 2,000 people have suffocated from lake overturn. Putting it all together, just since the first century, well over 180 million human beings have been killed by natural disasters. This is not just 100 stadiums, or 200, or 300, or 1,000, or 2,000, or 3,000, but 4,000 and five stadiums filled to maximum capacity. Remember, we can't blame human free will for these. Surely God could have created a world in which, you know, which, nat the, sorry, surely God could have created a world without such forces that cause natural disasters. In fact, the idea of heaven or paradise within religious traditions is evidence of this, or it demonstrates that it's possible. Surely if God exists, the death and devastation caused by natural disasters is absolutely, utterly baffling. However, if atheism is true, such na natural disasters are no less tra tragic, but at least we can explain them. They are the products of mindless forces like plate tectonics and tropical weather systems operating in the universe blind and indifferent to our struggle for survival. Thus the pitiless physical forces, forces that produce natural disasters are strong evidence for atheism and against classical theism. Atheism offers the best explanation for tumors, genetic disorders, mutations, diseases, illnesses, and infections. Consider Wang Chun Sai. He has a terrible case of neurofibromatosis. Wang's face was covered with massive tumors weighing a total of 50 pounds. <coughs> They have stunted his growth, left his bones undeveloped, caused his spine to buckle and restrict his breathing, a life-crippling condition that has prevented Wong from leaving his small village. Leukemia, breast cancer, colon cancer, the list goes on and on. Just this year, about 569,490 Americans are expected to die of cancer. That's more than 1,500 people a day. Taste sex. An, auto, an autosomal recessive genetic disorder. Precious infants become blind, deaf, and unable to swallow. 
Muscles begin to atrophy and paralysis sets in. Death usually occurs before the age of four. We could also look at cystic fibrosis, sickle cell disease, Down syndrome, Turner syndrome, cleft palate, conjoined twins, and literally hundreds of others. More than 25 million humans have suffered and died from AIDS <clears throat> since 1981. 70 million flesh and blood human beings have died of tuberculosis. Just since the 6th century, more than 200 million have died because of the bubonic plague. The Spanish flu of 1918 took the lives of between 50 to 100 million people. Globally, at least 250,000 humans are stripped of their lives each and every year of the seasonal flu. Malaria has taken the lives of approximately 165 million people since the 20th century. It is spread by mosquitoes and kills an African child every 30 seconds. Measles has destroyed the lives of about 200 million people in the last 150 years, causing blindness and brain damage, killing 530,000 humans a year, mostly children. Smallpox has decimated the lives of approximately 300 million men, women, and children since the early 20th century. That's 6,659 stadiums. If we combine these pandemics and diseases, we have over 1 billion, with a B, 60 million deaths. This is not just 100 stadiums, not 1,000, not 10,000. It is not even 20,000 stadiums. It's 22,000 stadiums, 529 and a half. We haven't even touched on the millions that die from lower respiratory infections, diarrhea, whooping cough, te tetanus, meningitis, syphilis, yellow fever, typhoid fever. Nor have we mentioned the variety of psychological and emotion disorders that may not be fatal but cause an enormous amount of turmoil and suffering. If the god of classical theism exists, the misery and destruction caused by all these afflictions has to remain incomprehensible and virtually inexplicable. On the other hand, atheism, by supposing the absence of a caring God, combined with blind and personal competing natural forces, which have no regard for human life, yields greater explanatory power. Atheism offers the best explanation for the presence of excessive, unjustified, or gratuitous pain and suffering in the world. We're not talking about the pain we can learn from by touching a hot stove, or the pain that can lead to a greater good, like something like a root canal. There's no way a morally perfect God would allow needless suffering like the severe pain felt by most people during a suffering from terminal advanced cancer. There's no justification for they're going to die anyway. As caring, compassionate human beings, we do all that we can to ease this kind of suffering with the limited means available to us. If the God of classical theism exists, he's even more caring and compassionate, right? Than we, and has a much greater ability to alleviate pain. Since we could not be morally superior to a morally perfect God, we would expect God to do, also do something to ease the unnecessary, the entirely unnecessary pain of cancer victims, but he doesn't. If God exists, then gratuitous pain and suffering cannot. There must be some ultimate justification, but God hasn't shared it with us. And those speaking on God's behalf have not figured it out yet. In contrast, if atheism is true, then we have an explanation. The sensation of pain evolved naturally is our body's way of warning us when something's wrong. But since evolution isn't a thoughtful, considerate process, it never figured out a way to turn the pain off when there was no more need of the warning. Thus, since only atheism is compatible with unjustified pain and suffering, and because unjustified pain and suffering exists, the existence of unjustified suffering in the world is evidence for atheism and against theism. Thank you so much. Uh, again, our final panelist will be Steve Shawnee, and he'll just the two minutes to start uh, right now. So, thanks. All right, well, I teach high school, so I know there's no God. Uh, <laughs> The arguments anyway. All right, well, happy Thanksgiving, by the way. I want to go. Um, thanks for joining us. Uh, I'd like to start by saying discussion of this topic really gives me great pleasure because I I'm really not interested in taking away uh, any comfort or happiness that belief in God brings people. Um, I'd actually like to increase those two things uh, as best I can. But insofar as theistic belief might inhibit people from promoting peace, equality, health, and happiness in this life, to that degree do I find it necessary to oppose. 
With that said, allow me to continue with several more arguments for atheism. To my mind, atheism offers the best explanation for the silence of God in the face of adversity. Consider the noted theologian and Lutheran pastor Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who, recognizing that God was doing nothing to stop the Holocaust, died in a Nazi prison after trying to kill Hitler himself. Why would God allow this for one of his devoted followers? Uh, consider child soldiers. More than 300,000 children right now are denied a childhood by being conscripted into combat, sent into minefields ahead of older troops, and sometimes used for suicide missions. There's also slavery. It's estimated that there are more than 27 million slaves in the world today, and that's more than at the height of the transatlantic slave trade. Uh, recently, if you saw the article, 168 children uh, between the ages of 7 and 15 were kidnapped or purchased by gang members in Romania, smuggled to Great Britain uh, in order to beg and steal for this gang, of course. Uh, many of them were mutilated and disabled on purpose to evoke more sympathy uh, from passerbys. There's also sex trafficking. Uh, lured by false promises of jobs, thousands are forced to sleep with upwards of 20 men a day at $20 apiece. Uh, and every 30 seconds, a woman or child becomes a victim. Child mortality. In 2009 alone, 8.1 million children died before their fifth birthday. That's 22,191 uh, 22, children died each and every day. Half of these because of malnutrition, the lack of safe drinking water and sanitation. And many just need mosquito nets to prevent the spread of uh, malaria or, or any disease. Um, that's an entire stadium every two days to continue the thing. Um, one child every five seconds dies as a result of hunger, 700 every hour, 16,000 a day, 6 million a year. All of this without even mentioning the many feral children often abandoned or abused by their parents, like Danny, who was locked in a closet for seven years. Why does the God of classical theism not intercede? Think about it. If God is not answering the distressed petitions of his own followers, of children, or of the thousands of mothers around the world whose, pr whose prayers are being answered. What can I ask is more sincere than a mother praying for her dying baby? Now, it can be objected that many people have felt God's comforting presence or experienced answered prayers during adversity. <clears throat> but isn't it possible that the people who believe they have experienced God in this way are mistaken about the source of that comfort? Of course it is. We all know that the mere idea of a God acting as a placebo could help believers through adversity without God ever truly existing. Consequently, both atheism and theism um, could offer explanations uh, for filling God's comforting presence. But this is not true when it comes to explaining instances where God's comfort isn't felt. Only atheism has a sufficient answer for that. Thus, God's silence in the face of adversity, including child soldiers, slavery, human trafficking, and child mortality, is a significant problem for classical theism, which asserts, remember, a loving, benevolent, and just God. This leads us to what we might call the hiddenness, or absence, of God. Atheism offers the best explanation for this. If the omnipresent God of classical theism exists, and wants his existence to be known, then it is strange that the evidence for it isn't stronger. Many religionists act, religionists act as though God's existence were utterly obvious. And if you deny it, you have a dark heart, a rebellious nature, or a moral problem of some sort. Now, even though millions despise a Hitler or Stalin, Pol Pot, Obama, or Bush, um, not a single person we've ever met denied their existence. It would be different if someone could say, hey, come here. You know, Steve, Dan, this is God. God, this is Dan, Steve. Um, if it was this obvious, well, of course, we wouldn't be here. But then uh, we could scorn those who denied his existence. Now, going back to the positivists, of course, and empirical verification, we cannot meet, shake the hand of, see, audibly hear, physically touch, or empirically verify God in any human and sensorial way. And this severely, this severely lessens the force of any claim that this personal entity exists. You can say an omnipresent being exists. He ought to be there in some sense, right? If atheism is true, however, the reason for God's hiddenness is really clear. He's not there. And, um, uh, excuse me, thus divine hiddenness is evidence for atheism and against classical theism that we call postulates an omnipresent deity. Moving on. Atheism offers the best explanation of religious history. If it were true that God has revealed himself through the world's religions, then we would not expect religion's success to be explicable through natural means, but rather would expect religions to display unique and undeniable signs of divine favor. Christianity, the world's largest religion, began to thrive not through God, but through Constantine, and the Roman Empire declaring Christianity the one true religion. 
They gained ability to eliminate competing religions, passing laws that called for their extermination. Christianity embarked on a lengthy reign of terror, burning books, people, destroying cultures, launching religious crusades and genocides, and excommunicating uh, or murdering so-called heretics. And so we have it, the largest religion in the world today has one of the bloodiest histories. <clears throat> If Christianity is merely the product of human invention, then it isn't surprising to find it has dominated the world scene by being the most violent, not the most reasonable. Now, if God existed, regardless of which religion is true, we would, we would not expect him to have sat by and let this happen. Instead, God should have intervened to either set Christianity straight or to have defeated Christianity in the name of whatever other religion was more representative of God. But if atheism is true, then there is no God to interfere in any warfare, or religious warfare will offer divine favor to any group of believers. Basically, there would be no religion that displays evidence of God's favor or divine origin, and indeed, there is not. At least that I can find. Related to this, atheism offers the best explanation for religious confusion. If God exists, we would expect that he would have made the path he desires for all his followers to take to be clear and obvious so that we could have no confusion about it. In fact, it would seem that doing so would be God's moral duty, especially if there were consequences for choosing the wrong path. And um, Islam and Christianity offer some pretty horrific consequences for not believing. However, consider the rich and incompatible diversity of religious claims made worldwide. The religious landscape is hopelessly confused and cluttered by conflicting holy books, religious authorities, conflicting opinions about the nature of God and the supernatural. However, if atheism is true, there is no truth in the God hypothesis for believers to discover. Thus, no reason to expect them to agree about any of it. Therefore, the multiplicity of conflicting religious ideologies is evidence for atheism and against theism. Moreover, atheism offers the best explanation for predation. Why would an intelligent, designing, and benevolent deity create a world in which the food for living sentient beings is quite often other living sentient beings? Why do many animals have to eat each other in order to survive? In fact, why would the god of classical theism create animals as beings that needed to eat in the first place? I don't know what you're saying, but it's probably good. Um, why not base sustainability on photosynthesis or chemosynthesis or some other mechanism to avoid the predator-prey dynamic? In any respect, the daily routine of life on Earth is a continual bloodbath of fear, hunting, being hunted, combat, suffering, and death. Every moment of every day, it's business as usual for animals to be eaten alive, narrowly escape, or even have their internal organs devoured from within by parasites. Uh, some wasps, after paralyzing their victim, inject their eggs into its body, and of course that larva develops, slowly eating its host from the inside out. Um, and we've all seen zebras on Animal Planet, of course, still alive as lions tear open the abdomen and eat the entrails. Um, will the god of classical theism take credit for this? Who would want to be known as the architect of a crocodile's jaws, the teeth of a great white, or the venom of spiders? From the vacuum of space itself, to solar flares, radiation, extreme temperatures, reckless asteroids, black holes, supernovas, etc., there is hardly a single place of refuge for life. Even in our relatively calm, Earth and life-sponsoring solar system, rocks, moons, planets, asteroids, and comets are still aimlessly speeding um, around the sun in varying orbits that oftentimes overlap and intersect. <coughs> you may have noticed our moon, okay? It's heavily scarred, littered with craters. Such is the result of countless impacts. There is also a massive asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. It's either the leftover rock that did not form into planets or is the product of planets smashing into each other at some point in the solar system's past. What is its purpose? It's beyond difficult to reconcile why a god of order and precision designed space to contain ice and rocks <coughs> radically flying around only to slam into the moon, each other, earth, or whatever else with no particular purpose. If atheism is true, it makes sense that an impersonal and mechanical universe would be this unsympathetic toward life. Thus, the hostility of the universe, including the random and chaotic movements of objects in space, is evidence for atheism and against the classical theism, which presumes an ordered, purposive, <coughs> life-designing, life-giving deity. <laughs> atheism, finally, offers the best explanation for poor designs and the flaws of evolution. 
99% of every species that has ever lived is now out of existence. Considering that statistic, is it really conceivable that evolution is being directed by an intelligent or competent or personal agent? To highlight a few poor designs, hundreds of animals die at birth, that's not news. Spontaneous natural abortions are numerous and widespread. Multitudes of women throughout history have died during childbirth. Mm -hmm. The reason? Because um, uh, the human brain, of course, is large and it requires a larger skull. Combine that with a too narrow uh, a birth canal and that's what you get. Um, for our mouth is also too small for our wisdom teeth. And uh, in the last debate, Dr. Myers mentioned during, uh, when humans stood up, it was like standing at the Golden Gate Bridge and our backs bear the burden and stress. Bipedalism, of course, has its advantages, but serious limitations as well. Now, why can't we produce vitamin C like other animals? Nearly all mammalian species have the ability. We don't. To conclude then, it would seem extremely difficult for one to be convinced of the existence of a benevolent deity in the face of such enormous suffering and malice. It does not seem possible to believe in a just God in the presence of rampant injustice, nor to honestly affirm the existence of a moral God when immorality, amorality, and pitiless indifference abound. Classical theism asserts, asserts an omnipresent being, but no such God can be identified anywhere, let alone everywhere. Classical theism further assumes a God of intelligent design, precision, and order, yet the universe exudes the opposite qualities of randomness, disorder, and imprecision. Classical theism proposes a God of omnipotence, but unnecessary pain and evil are never stopped. In essence, classical theism must create a cognitive dissonance by asserting attributes of God that cannot possibly be true in a universe that displays contradictory qualities. Atheism points out this discrepancy and says that if such and such opposing phenomena exist, and they do, then the God of classical theism cannot. <clears throat> we are compelled to ask, what would a universe without God look like if not this one? 